All right, so it is 12 p.m. So we're gonna get started with Business Fights for October. So hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Brian Lay from Hannah House at Newport Beach and it's my pleasure to welcome you all. If you are new to Business Fights, this is a series in collaboration between Hannah House and Honest Access. Hannah House is a flexible co-working space and cafe with two locations, one in Palo Alto and one in Newport Beach. And although we are temporarily closed at the moment, we do offer these free types of virtual events every, mo every month uh, with topics surrounding science, technology, and business and innovation. Our partner, Honest Access, is an innovation and consulting firm. And we together host Business Bites every second Wednesday of the month with thought leaders sharing insights and experience, as well as having an amazing fire chat conversation. So before we jump into our amazing panel discussion today, we do have some housekeeping items. The session is being recorded, so no need to worry. We'll have that uploaded onto our Hannah House YouTube page and then emailed out to everyone here. Please utilize the chat box for any questions and engage with your virtual community. And at the end of the session, we will be sending out a survey uh, to get any feedback to improve our future series. Uh, follow Hannah House and Honest Access on our social media to stay updated on any new events. So without any further ado, um, I will introduce Shelly from Honest Access as today's moderator. So take it away, Shelly. Hi, thanks, Brian. Thank you, Hannah House, for this collaboration. It's really fun um, doing this every month. This is my first time moderating uh, Virtual Business Bites, so I'm super excited. Um, I'm the founder and principal of On Its Axis. Uh, we're based in Orange County, California. We have a satellite office in Philadelphia, P PA, and that's where I actually am right now, even though I appear to be in Newport Beach, sunny Newport Beach. We're going to have an exciting conversation today about reimagining leadership, very timely topic. We have four incredible thought leaders that are on our panel today. I want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for your time, you're volunteering your time today to share with the larger community here um, about leadership in these times. We're gonna go through some questions that you can share with the audience. Looking forward to a really fun and productive conversation with all of you. So thank you for being here. So why don't we start um, with Lotus. Lotus, can you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your role? Sure. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Lotus Buckner, and I am the Director of Human Resources at Northwest Community Healthcare. We're in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, so been knee deep into COVID. Um, I'm still in my office, so haven't been working remotely. But I also um, consult on the side. So I do career coaching and career strategy, as well as leadership development um, through LB Talent Solutions, which is my business. And um, the third hat I wear is a passion project where I do similar roundtables to this around diversity and inclusion, which I think is a really important topic right now. Thanks for having uh, me. Thanks for being here. I agree, that's such an important topic. Um, why don't we have Amy, can you introduce yourself? Let us let know a little bit about um, your background and your role. Uh, I know you previously were with Symantec. Yes, uh, thank you again for also uh, um, inviting me to attend. I always learn so much from these events. I'm Amy Capilanti wolf and I have uh, decades of experience working in human resources and business transformation, having been at Frito-Lay, Disney, Sun, Cisco, a startup that we took public called Silver Spring, and most recently Symantec. Um, I've become the queen of business transformation, divestitures, and acquisitions, and so in February, I left Symantec after we sold uh, over half of our business to Broadcom. And now I'm taking some time off and I'm joining boards. Just joined a managed IT services board this summer. And I'm doing some advisory support and writing articles and spending time with my family. I've cooked more meals in the last six months for my family than I have in the entire time my daughters have been on this planet. So it's been a journey during this time, but um, learning a lot and there for support to others. Love that. Thank you. That sounds like an incredible time and you have an incredible career background to share with all of us today. Thank you. Um, Stephen, can you, can you take the helm and introduce yourself to yeah, all of us? Yeah, sure. 
Uh, also, just uh, like the rest of the panel, very excited to be here and excited to learn. Uh, as Amy mentioned, uh, it's good to share, but it's also really good to learn. Uh, so I'm the CHRO of Panasonic Automotive. Um, a lot of people don't understand uh, a lot of what Panasonic does these days. 90% of our business uh, is B2B, so we we put our name on almost nothing these days. So just for instance, uh, almost all of the batteries for Teslas are Panasonic. Um, for instance, we do <clears throat> primarily all the infotainment, uh, safety cameras, clusters for the OEMs. So Toyota, Honda, Nissan, GM, FCA um, are some of our uh, biggest uh, uh, customers. We have about uh, 9,000 people as part of the automotive division headquartered out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and a lot of challenges associated with uh, uh, COVID and manufacturing and everything else, the same as everybody else. Um, Thank you. One thing that calls out to me right away is the diverse backgrounds that you all that you all share and different locations. Um, Dr. Walker, why don't you share with us a little bit about your background and your role? Once I remember to take myself off mute, that would be very, very helpful. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Very excited to join you today and really appreciate the invitation. And uh, like all of these great HR practitioners, I have been doing this a little while. I think I'm in my 27th year. I jokingly say I started when I was about seven, so that will help you with the age, right? But no, I am just excited about HR and am really consider myself fortunate that I've been able to contribute to uh, several industries and organizations, primarily nonprofits and hospitals. So also like Amy, I've been part of huge acquisitions um, as healthcare has taken on a new life and it's not so much hospitals anymore, but it's more like healthcare administration and hospitals taking over hospitals. So that is my background right now. I'm happy to be supporting California Community Foundation, which is really doing some just outstanding work in the area of community service. Right now we are supporting others in the areas of COVID-19 and also wildfires. Um, we are very active in immigration, education and health and housing initiatives uh, out in LA County. So I'm just very, very pleased and excited about joining you today and sharing what I think I know a little bit about this world. That's great. You all know quite a bit. And that's why you're here and we really appreciate it. So I want to dive into, it sounds like a basic question. This one, we'll start with Amy on this. Um, and and it's, it's really, what are some challenges today's leaders are facing? I think we know some of the obvious ones, but from your experience, Amy, tell us what you're seeing or what you've been seeing um, in today's leadership function. Well, um, you know, it's, I think we're all probably going to answer similarly, but I think it's unprecedented times. Uh, there was a skit on Saturday Night Live I won't go back to about unprecedented, but the, the, the view is I think you've got the pandemic, okay? So with that, you've got business resiliency concerns, you've got employees that need safety, employees at home with their families trying to do their jobs and support their families. You've got racial injustice, which is nothing new, which has finally come to a head. And I think we're at a place now where you, um, you can no longer let that sort of subside on its own. It's going to have to be real action. Um, you've got the political environment happening right now in the United States, which has lots of people distracted about what does that mean for them personally once an election is complete. And then you've got this crazy weather patterns. In California, we've got tons of fires. Uh, in the South, uh, you've got hurricanes. So there's just disruption beyond disruption right now. And I think leaders are trying to figure out how do I, how do I remain uh, steady and, and grounded in what I do, but also how do I be uh, driving my business for success when it's a whole different paradigm than anyone's ever experienced before? Thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, why don't we have, um, Stephen, would you like to share a bit based on what you're seeing in your industry? Yeah, um, like uh, Amy mentioned, uh, maybe not a lot of different answers, but certainly uh, 
Uh, we've seen the complexity of, you know, COVID uh, from a leadership perspective. Our leaders have had to pick up new skills that uh, they really weren't exercising before very well. Let's just put it that way. Uh, one, again, keeping their employees safe, the ones that were in the office, but also trying to convince the ones that are not in the office to also do some of the uh, same protocols and safety measures at home that we were doing at work. It's so much safer to be at work than to be at home. A lot of the cases that we've seen have actually been of employees that are at home, not, uh, not at work. Uh, and then how do you keep your group connected, right? So you got this group that's uh, spread out, uh, a lot of people working from home, you've got some on-site, some off-site. So trying to keep them engaged, connected, uh, is, is taking a lot different skill set uh, than they've been exercising. Uh, a lot of them, especially for us, have been exercising uh, in the past. Um, and definitely the diversity, equity, inclusion aspect of the role from a leader. In the past, a lot of that has been shouldered by either executives or HR people. So we do a lot of that back-end infrastructure, really looking at that equity analysis, making sure that we create processes that are fair and equitable, but the leaders have kind of been shielded for some of that in the past. And what we're doing now is we're putting a lot of that ownership right on the shoulders of the leaders. You've got to be educated enough to have conversations around this. You need to be un, uh, clearly informed on uh, equity issues and inclusion issues and what that looks like and unconscious bias and uh, having conversations, meaningful conversations with your team on what it feels like to work at Panasonic. And those are not things that we asked our leaders to do in the past either. Um, even part of our culture change, because we had a lot of culture change going on in the past, uh, which helped leaders get a lot better at communicating, but specifically around these topics, uh, they've just not done it uh, a lot um, so everybody feels a little nervous about going, regardless of what side you're on, you feel a little nervous going into these conversations. So we spent a lot of time just helping leaders get comfortable being uncomfortable about having conversations they need to have. Imagine there's a lot of education that, that is happening too, like you said, on terminology and what these things are. They've existed and some organizations are you know, more aware of, of the terms and how to apply them in the workplace. But for some, it's, it's just brand new. It's like starting over. Um, Dr. Walker, can you share with us some of the challenges that you're seeing for leaders today? Sure. I think really, I, I've, and everything that has already been spoken, I echo 100%. But what I see also is that leaders are really wrestling with their passion, their purpose, and perseverance. How do we wrap all of that into uh, actionable items to keep everyone productive, motivated, and keep the business running? You have to think now more about uh, your, your internal and your external stakeholders. And our, as everyone has said, staffing is, is huge. And I feel like leaders are wrestling with how to do more with less. There's less time there's less staffing, in some cases there's less funding, and there's less opportunities. And so how are we bottling all of that up and delivering it in a way that keeps us all engaged? Um, to Stephen's point, how are we staying connected? And most importantly, how are we getting the work done? How are we living true to our mission and our vision and our values when everything around us is changing? Uh, I don't think uh, seven months ago, when we talked about the pandemic, would I know for me personally, I did not think we would still not be closer to an end seven months later. Now here we are ending the year, and we don't know what 2021 is going to look like. And so I think leaders are forced to have to really reinvent what the new normal will look like, and that's scary for a lot of people. Absolutely. Um, Lotus, I'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well on this. Yeah, I think two things that I would add is emotional intelligence. I think as leaders, this is becoming more and more important when you think about what's coming into our workplaces. 
in dealing with issues around race and inclusion, politics now with the election coming up. How are you dealing with that at work? I think that's been a challenge for leaders. For some areas, the natural disasters that were mentioned are certainly new challenges that leaders may not have had to face before. And then the mental health right now and the increase in that and how you deal with that and support your team through that, I think is a challenge. And the second one I think is self wellness. So as leaders, what I noticed, we did an analysis even on time off, our leaders are taking a really big burden um, with all the changes that are going on and everything that they have on their plates right now. And I think a lot of leaders are challenged with remembering themselves and taking some self care time. Um, and or, because if you can't take care of yourself, you're not gonna be able to take care of your team. But that's something that's really hard for us to kind of admit to and then take action around. So those would be my two. That's great. It's, I love how each of you, there were similar feelings, obviously, um, that you shared, but you all had different ideas uh, on what leaders are facing and, and maybe a little bit around what's most important for them uh, to be thinking about right now. So thank you, those were, those were great. Um, so I guess the next question is around reimagining leadership. So some of this might have been touched on, but I think we can go a little bit deeper. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily what you're doing or your organizations are doing, or it could be. But when you, if you're to reimagine leadership in this new normal that we're in, what does that look like? Um, what, what, what could it look like? And I think, you know, we could maybe start with Stephen and, and, and go around. Um, if you wouldn't mind Stephen kicking us off. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, and I'll talk about something that uh, we've actually done that um, from a timing perspective, it worked out pretty well. We, about uh, four or five years ago, we completely revamped our culture model. Um, and at that point, uh, uh, creating a set of principles, values, and behaviors that we live by, um, we really had to rethink that whole leadership model. Uh, and very similar to what Lotus was saying, uh, a lot of skills that were there with tactical leaders. We had a lot of engineers. We have a lot of manufacturing folks. We had people who were very good accountants, very good engineers, but maybe not so good in that emotional intelligence space. Uh, when you change a culture to really focus on how you treat people, behavior and authenticity and uh, compassion and things of that nature, uh, it really changes the dynamics of that uh, leadership team. Uh, and for us, you know, we ask leaders to start building relationships with their team. Uh, early on, have conversations, get away from this once a year, even twice a year discussion on where you are with your goals, objectives, talk to them and talk to them often and talk to them a lot about how they're doing. And again, how it feels to work in the organization and what they want to do motivationally uh, as a career and how they're living up to the expectations of the behaviors and values in the organization. So it was a really significant change for us. Uh, to have leaders to want to build relationships with folks. And the other thing we did, we asked them to be change agents. And this was a tough one. People don't normally like change. And we said four or five years ago, things are going to change really, really, they're already changing really, really quick. We're in the middle of a digital transformation. So everything that we were doing from a work process was going to completely change the next year with integrating, you know, several different ERP systems into one ERP system. We had a new culture, a new leadership model. There were so many changes going on. We said, you've got to get really good at change. Become change agents, help people navigate. You've got to figure out how to navigate this change, but you're in a leadership where you have to be, you have to take care of those that are in your charge, as Simon Sinek would say, you're not in charge. You're, in, you're, you're there to take care of people in your charge. And to do that, you got to help navigate that change for them as well. So we did a lot of work around uh, uh, change, change management, OCM, and what that means from a leadership perspective. And those were two really drastic things that really not only helped our culture, but dramatically changed the way people feel in our organization, uh, which now with uh, COVID uh, and with a lot of the issues around diversity, equity, inclusion, compassion, 
listening to your team, leadership, trust, all of that really has paid a lot of dividends for us. That's fantastic. It sounds like your organization's fairly forward looking and, and established change agility even ahead of the pandemic, um, which is remarkable. Um, Dr. Walker, can you share with us uh, if you were to reimagine leadership? Oh what my! Does that look like? Yeah. So Where do you start? I would. I would love for us to put more emphasis in our recruitment, retention, and reward strategy. I think that the that um, Lotus said it well also just thinking about the emotional intelligence and also self-care. I do think that in order for us to be successful, we have to take care of our own first. And it, won't, it doesn't matter if you are for-profit or non-profit, the people that are doing the work have to become a priority. And how do we do that? It's not so much just throwing great salaries or great benefits, but how do we do like Stephen has done in Panasonic and just looked at our culture dynamics? How do we really look at diversity, equity, and inclusion? How do we think more strategically about having the right people in the right roles? Because a lot of times we have great people, but they're not in the right position. And so we don't really see the best from them. And we've got to start thinking a little bit more strategically about how to utilize our talent, how to attract great talent, and then how to keep that talent in-house. Because I think all of us recognize that there are options for people and people can make decisions about where they work and how they contribute. And so in my mind, um, leadership that is thinking more inward um, and being more accountable to those that are within the foundation or the organization, that's going to really serve the communities well, serve the industries well, and just serve us all as human beings better. I love that, thinking about the people and talent and how to cultivate that. And it's interesting, you drew from some of what Lotus shared to share your insights. Lotus, how would you reimagine leadership? Would you look at it from that inward perspective? How is your, how, or how are your organizations looking at it um, in this new normal? 100%. I love what Dr. Walker said because I am a huge believer in a people first um, mentality and the way that I think about reimagining leadership is really adopting a, an intentional leadership mentality. I talk about intentional leadership a lot. And what I mean by that is be thoughtful about your decisions and their impacts. Be more conscious about your unconscious biases, right? Let's stop using unconscious biases, the fact that it's unconscious as an excuse. Um, be more caring when employees bring an issue forward to you. Be more of an active listener when others are talking. Be more willing to go against the status quo when the status quo is not good enough. Be willing to step out on nothing if that means doing the right thing or standing up for people. Be willing to bring your whole authentic self to work so that others feel like they can also do the same. Because as leaders, people are following us and they're looking at us to go first. So we need to go first even when, I think Steven said it, even when it's uncomfortable. So. To me, reimagining leadership is let's be more intentional leaders and not just these tactical working leaders. That's fantastic. I love that. And I would imagine, um, Amy, you shared with us earlier that you, you've had to reimagine leadership probably in the, in the organizations you worked in. You worked in all these different types of organizations and large organizations and also at home, you've had to reimagine your own leadership. Um, where, how would you see it uh, if we were to look at leadership and say this is this is the vision that we want to have for the future? Um, share with us your thoughts on that. Are they similar to the others, or do you have a different approach that you might might take? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, I couldn't agree enough or more than what everyone has said. I mean, it's all those things, empathy, compassion, listening, uh, engaging, uh, taking care of yourself and others. There's an interesting um, uh, view to leadership that was, I think, formed like in 2014. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It's called host leadership. 
versus hero leadership. And very often um, in our vernacular, as we've grown up uh, in, in thinking about leaders, they're often people we look to to be omnipotent and having um, omnipotent and having all the answers, the ones that will take the hill and charge and protect all of us and save all of us. And that's that's neither right nor is it even um, expected in these de in these times right now to expect leaders to be all those things. But I think what is shifting, which sort of resonates with me when I heard what everybody else was saying was this notion of host leadership, which is like you're hosting a gathering. So at the very beginning, the host is front and center because they're inviting people in. They're ensuring the people they invite in are collaborative and, and are coalescing around a particular um, party event, for instance, we use, we use the analogy of having a, a party or a gathering at your place. So you invite people in, you ensure everyone is fed and welcomed, and then you take a step back to give people space and to collaborate and to do their work together. And, and then you come back in to ensure that the event was, was successful. And I've taken a couple of notes because I, I really like this concept, but it's really around, you're the initiator, you invite people in, you create space, you're the gatekeeper to ensure people are behaving and coalescing well and reciprocating the respect you're giving to them. You're connecting people and you're also participating. So if you think about leadership as more of a host and a facilitator role versus command and um, hierarchy, uh, and also that you're human and that you have your challenges as well, it's a way to think about leadership differently. And also I think aligns to the times we're in today where there's so much change happening and there's so much uncertainty that the more real and authentic you can be and, and really invite people into the conversation, the more effective you're going to be at, at leading people during this difficult time. So it's, it's, a, it's a great little model and I've, I've just become familiarized with it over the last year. And it's something that I think it might be worth unpacking a little bit more because there's lots of interesting uh, tools that you can think about as well as behaviors and expectations you're setting for your leaders. Was that a book that you shared with us, Amy? It's actually, um, it, there's a book around host leadership, and I can actually send the link out if you'd like that or send that to you. And it's a whole whole concept around sort of reimagining leadership. And this was back in 2014, which I know there was probably times there where that really mattered, but I think now pulling it forward, it seems so much more critical. Absolutely. It's interesting. It's kind of like um, modeling behavior for others. Exactly. Um, being a leader, but modeling that and hoping others sort of catch on. Um, and it takes you sharing that. And it takes you out of the middle. Because I think there's the, the notion that the leaders are on top of everything in the middle of everything and being able to be on the outside to facilitate it and, and teach people so they're doing it versus you doing it for them or commanding them to do it. It's just, it just it's one, it's a lot less stress on the leader and the teams want to, want to, they want to be treated like adults. They want to be able to do their work. So it's just a different paradigm to consider. So I, I would encourage folks to take a look at it. I think it's got a lot of relevance right now. Thank you. Each of you shared such interesting ideas and insights around leadership and how we might reimagine it. Um, this is wonderful. I want to ask this one. Um, let's start with Dr. Walker. So we talk a lot about employee agency, right? And getting employees to sort of own, own what they know um, and being entrepreneurs in the workplace, um, coming up with new ideas and sharing them. How can promoting employee agency and entrepreneurship benefit an organization's culture? So oh, I, 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 this one was, <laughs> this one was tougher for me to think about than any of the other questions. And it, not because I didn't have an answer, but I was searching for like the perfect answer or the right answer. And it's, it's funny to me because when I think about both employee agency and entrepreneurship and the benefit to culture, I just think so much about relationships. And if everyone is working towards understanding and setting clear expectations, these things happen organically. And the reason we see sometimes that these are challenged is because we're forcing relationships that don't connect or don't match. And it's not, you know, I don't think anyone benefits anymore from top down leadership or even bottom up leadership. I think that you have to think holistically about the fact that this is ours. And when I look bad or when something doesn't go right, it's not just a reflection on me, it's a reflection on us. So we have to change from me to we, 
that and build the relationships that make people invested in the overall success. As HR, I think, you know, I am here to take care of the people that take care of people. That's my job. But at the end of the day, I benefit from the collective work of others. So I can't do my job without finance. I can't do my job without IT. I can't do my job without programs or administration or development or all the other components in our, in our infrastructure. So I, I focus on creating relationships where people can talk, where people can trust, where people can hold each other accountable and where people can have what I consider, and I know we've said, you've probably heard this term a lot, where you can have courageous conversations about what is not working and have those conversations timely and without, almost without the emotion, because let's stick to the facts. Let's understand what problem we're trying to solve. And then let's build an understanding and build a cohesiveness that gets us to more of both of these um, ideas and concepts. And that's how the culture is going to really shift. Um, I, I definitely ask um, organizations, if, if you're struggling with your culture, it's not the culture that has a problem, it's the relationships. So. Yeah, focusing on building trust, open yeah, exactly. communication and transparency. Right? That's Absolutely. a great point. Thank you. Um, Lotus, you are, I would imagine, an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. <laughs> How can promoting uh, employee agency and entrepreneurship benefit an organization's culture? Well, I cannot say it better than Dr. Walker. I believe in everything that she had shared. Um, what I would add to that is what benefits you reap. I think you reap the same benefits of entrepreneurship, right? When I think of an entrepreneur, I think of um, high commitment, high engagement, high ownership, unmatched passion, super results-oriented people, right? And if you want that spirit, you have to promote that spirit within your organizations. So if you give people autonomy, they'll show you ownership. If you give people genuine support, resources, and trust, they'll get you results, they'll make you money. Give people appreciation and they'll give you loyalty. They'll give you your blood, their blood, sweat, and tears. Um, if you give people a genuine sense of inclusion and belonging when they come to work, they'll give you their whole selves. They'll bring their whole selves to work then. Um, humans want to give. Like, that's a very natural thing for us. And so we just need to put the brakes on um, when we feel threatened. And so a lot of times people are like, well, shouldn't it just be a given? Well, it's not. We don't bring our whole selves and we don't do all of these things and give it all we've got for a reason. There's always a reason behind that. And so I think the foundation there is trust. So if you have trust, you can really build this culture of entrepreneurship and have this spirit of ownership. Thank you. And I love that you brought in some of the characteristics uh, for entrepreneurs, because I don't know how our panelists, uh, you get this question a lot, but we get a lot of what is an entrepreneur, right? So that is a, an individual who is um, a lot of what Lotus just shared, motivated, passionate, um, self-aware, um, driving forward within an organization. And I'm wondering if, uh, I think we have time for Amy and Stephen just to share briefly uh, their ideas on this question. Um, Amy, if we could start with you. Um, well, I couldn't agree with both of the things that were just said, and I'll give you maybe an example that, um, that that's an old example, but it just rings so true. So when I was at Frito-Lay, we were uh, all enamored, as many companies were, about General, General Electric, GE. And one of the things that GE offered was this notion of a workout, which is basically you have a problem that you need to go solve that's related to the business. And as opposed to executives who are layers up trying to figure out what is the actual root cause of the issue. And is it really an issue? We brought everybody who touched that problem into the room and we facilitated, it could be an hour, two hours, three days, depending upon the complexity of the problem to get clear about what is the problem you're solving for? And then what do you know as a person who touches it every day that seems to contribute to this problem? And what are the things we're going to do to solve that problem that you're gonna own as part of that issue? And basically the one we had as an example is route sales um, drivers were having a hard time with um, 
delivering large loads into large um, grocery stores. So we went through a whole process where we had people who actually experienced the pain solve it. And so what that created was, you know, entrepreneurship, because now suddenly I get to not only identify the problem, but remove the obstacles with senior leadership support. And also I benefit, uh, I benefit from the, the fix of it versus people in the next room fixing it. And I think that goes back to get people together who know what the issue is and have them solve it versus always thinking you know better because you are a leader or manager layers up. And that reinforces, I think, what Dr. Walker and what Lotus uh, shared. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't agree with anybody. No, I'm just kidding. That's it. Uh, it was, I mean, all that is, uh, resonates with me a lot. So uh, for us, the, the, the whole idea of uh, entrepreneurship uh, fits right into our future leader model. So uh, going into one of the things that uh, Lotus mentioned was, you know, give people autonomy. You got to give people autonomy with a skill set to do something with it, which is what Amy was talking about. These workout sessions or tiger teams. So one of the things that we did, we actually, for our high potential development program, uh, we created uh, what we called uh, an emerging leader, um, emerging leader program, which was really built on this design thinking uh, concept where you, you go in, you're working on design thinking, you've got these workouts. We called them tiger teams. Uh, the, the guy who actually ran a lot of that for GE actually works for us now, uh, Dr. Doug Lapelli. And we created these tiger teams of people who are high potentials for one. In, we, we broke out the different problems in our organization by passion, which went to kind of Lotus's thing too. You got to have a passion for what you're working on. So if you're in the mix and this is your problem, you got a passion to fix it, then forget us as leaders. Just tell us what resources you need. Tell us what you need to be able to solve this problem for the organization. And it was amazing what the organization was able to solve for not only solving issues, but creating new products that we didn't even think about as an organization. So we have new product lines. We have things that we were not even involved with before uh, with smart cities and connected roads uh, because of a lot of this work that was being done, which drove passion and ownership and uh, motivation, all those things that were uh, mentioned by the others. Uh, it's huge. And it, I mean, it literally changes your organization. We have lots of revenue now based off things that were not part of our, our roadmap before. So it's, it's powerful. Sounds like that feeling of ownership makes work fun. Yeah. And therefore that, of course, that would benefit your organization's culture. That's great. All of, all of each of you shared such interesting um, examples. Um, and there are different ones. This is along the same lines. This is our last question before we open it up to Q and A. Um, and I think you, you touched on some of these, but what are some recommended techniques to foster a change agile environment? So um, earlier, Stephen talked about um, years ahead of its time. Panasonic was doing this type of work, helping leaders become agile. Um, telling them how important it was to be able to adapt to change. And we've heard other examples from the other panelists, just leaving this open question um, to a panelist that would like to jump in. Um, what are some techniques specifically for change agile environments? Um, if you haven't shared something, what is, what is one technique you could, you could recommend to, to our audience? I'll jump in. This is Amy. And I've, uh, I've worked in consumer goods. I've worked in entertainment in the last 20 or so years. I've been working in technology with the emphasis on software, hardware, and, and more recently software. And I think about software uh, development, which is agile. It's all about um, quick sprints around development cycles, checking in to see where you're at. Um, and so my, my view of this is to be change agile, you have to fail fast. And then you have to have um, celebrate those failures as learnings and then move into the next iteration. So you have to constantly iterate. And I kind of call it the 16 point turn. You know, when you're, you're trying to move into a parking spot and you're in a tough space, how many different times you have to approach that parking spot to get into the, the, right, the right location for your car. It's the same thing. You gotta be quick, fast, fail fast, and then move on so you can get to your, your, your outcome that you're trying to drive towards. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think to add to that is that when I thought about it is, you know, the first thing is to embrace change. We Nothing stays the same. And, and to recognize that even if you have a great product or you're doing great work, you can do more and you can do it differently. So want to be clear about not always getting comfortable in where you are and how things are going, even if that means they're good. And then accept change. You know, a lot of times, and I work in a lot of environments where people are in denial about change or in denial about what needs to be changed. And then lastly, monitor the change and its impact on the environment. Make sure that you are circling back with everyone, that there's clarity around what is changing, why it's changing, and how it needs to change. And don't leave that to uh, your HR folks to be the champion around change, but everyone has to participate from top down, bottom up. And I think that when you include those approaches in the process, you get um, an environment that is more welcoming and receives change more easily. Change is not always bad. It is definitely and can be a good thing. Yeah, if you don't like uh, change, you're gonna like uh, irrelevance even better, right? Even worse. So, you know, we had that uh, one thing that we did, we had our executives uh, as part of this uh, transformation, business transformation originally that we were going through, uh, we really wanted to build these change skills. And one of our core behaviors in our organization was around change agility. Uh, but, you know, very, very similar to what Amy was talking about, about making sure people feel comfortable that failing forward is okay. What does that mean? What does change agility look like? We had our executives go and do a 90 day sprint campaign throughout every single location that we had. They showed up, they did workshops. And again, it was not HR. We took this out of HR. We put it in the executives hands and they did workshop after workshop of change agility. What does it mean to have change agility? What does it look like? What are examples in the organization of really good change agility and what were the impacts? Uh, are leaders okay with their people failing forward? We had leaders that were not okay with their people failing forward. So we had to do work with our leaders to get people, you know, some of those leaders comfortable with that. So we spent 90 days with this campaign, just kind of grinding it in the heads of not only the leaders, but the employees of really the importance of change management, change agility. Uh, and now people speak to speak, right? It took 90 days to really over and over and over kind of preach that message where People understand it and they're picking books up about uh, design thinking and failing forward and those kind of things. So it's, it takes a while, but uh, we just uh, ended up just doing a campaign. Thank you. That's powerful that at first it was, there was some friction, um, there was some resistance, um, but I would imagine that they must have seen the value in it over those 90 days in order to, I'm curious what the turning point was if you're able to share, but um, that's, that's so positive. Yeah, again, probably uh, almost 90 days in, we had our high potentials volunteering to do more of those campaigns. Um, and you know, it wasn't even something we were trying to do stretch assignments or volunteering. So we put them in uh, uh, sort of out in front of the business and they kept those campaigns running. Uh, and now we have people volunteering on a regular basis to be part of our change agent network because we actually have not just our leaders who are change agents, but we do have a change agent network that helps us very similar to what Dr. Walker would say. What are you doing? How are you doing it? What changes are you trying to drive? And how are you measuring the success of those changes? Uh, and it is tough. I mean, it's a full time commitment for sure. Thank you for sharing all of that. Does anyone else want to share? Lotus, are you? Um, Stephen mentioned it. I was going to offer up design thinking as a technique that you can use to foster a change agile environment. Um, and so that's really, design thinking came from the idea of designing for the customer in mind, right? You, they talk a lot about avatars and you, you really think about your ideal customer and your design um, with that in mind. So you really think about that customer first. So when you even when we think about from an HR or leadership perspective, you're thinking about the changes that have created a change in our environments, right? When you think about COVID and you think about what success looks like in this new environment, like how do we deal with, if we were to deal with COVID really well, what would that look like? And then you design for that um, 
kind of end result. And same with like diversity and inclusion. Um, if this is something that your organization didn't take seriously now and you want to take it seriously now, what does success really look like there in design for that? Great. Thank you. You all shared so many interesting ideas and techniques with us. Um, I think now's probably a good time to open it up to audience questions. Um, I'm not sure if we have any in the chat that we might want to bring forth. I saw a question, it reads, as leaders, how have you all addressed your mental health during this pandemic? Have you adopted new routines or practices to enhance your self wellness? I don't know if I read it, does that mean I need to answer it? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, you know, I have an HR inappropriate answer, and this is a safe space because I don't see anyone from my employer on the line. But, you know, <laughs> one of the things that I do do is I, I am allowing myself grace to be frustrated uh, and to not have all the answers. Um, I have told myself not to panic even when there was reason and cause to panic. Uh, and, you know, I enjoy a good cocktail. And even though I'm sipping while we talk, I promise you that's just iced tea. But uh, I, 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 I allow myself forgiveness um, and I try to keep up with the competing priorities. But if I cannot, um, I think that self-care is super important. Uh, I I am a new grandma. My granddaughter is six months old, and so I am enjoying her. Uh, and so we live where we work. So my house is now my office. And so everything is happening in one space. And so you have to allow yourself uh, some space to make sure you're balanced in all these things and all these priorities. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's the most HR appropriate answer. <laughs> and if your HR department, if anyone's HR department does not think so, we need to flip that HR department on its head. <laughs> I can add also, I, um, I've been doing a lot of meditation and journaling. Um, there's a great app called Headspace. I, I'm not um, advertising for them. I, I, I pay for the subscription. Um, I re actually re re recently wrote an article for Forbes about meditation not only being good for your soul, but also making you a better leader because you suspend judgment. Um, you listen better because you're not caught up in the outcome. And I've had some real success. And they're easy modules. They're like 15 to 20 minutes a day. And then you can reflect afterwards in a journal if you so want to. But it's helped me um, kind of rewire my, my brain in terms of how I react to things. Because very often we have you know, fear or, you know, you either fight or you flee. And so some of the things out of the, out of the meditation, and I've been doing for many years, but most recently I've really been focused on is like, how do I, how do I deal through times of uncertainty? And so um, it's not, you don't have to be professional. You can do your own type of meditation. You can do guided. It's whatever works best for you. But I've had a real, very good outcomes from that. And I think it's something that um, it's worthwhile for not only individuals, but companies and leaders to consider. Yeah, to that, uh, Amy, we actually uh, did some of that work internal corporate wide. So uh, we had some requests for some mindfulness training. Um, and so we wound up bringing some uh, people in that uh, actually worked with uh, Google. I don't know if you read the book, Search Inside Yourself. Um, mm -hmm. A really good book uh, written by a, a, a gentleman from, uh, from Google who did a lot of work in that mindfulness space. Uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, at first, again, we're very heavily engineering and manufacturing oriented. So we had a lot of people go, man, this is soft. Actually, when I gave it to the CEO originally, he, he read the first few chapters and put it down. Uh, now, almost every quarterly meeting or whatever, he keeps talking about all his meditation, right? It took him, took him a year or so to get to a point where he understood the value. But part of that was just educating people through these mindfulness classes uh, at work. Um, and uh, we see a lot of people that uh, would never, had never even considered uh, meditation before now doing that. So yeah, I can, that's been very helpful. I guess along those same lines, I'm curious if anyone 
has also started a new hobby during this time. Um, your home more, um, your home and work have converged as many of you shared today. Um, I don't know if there's room for that, if there's room for, for hobbies. Uh, Amy mentioned she's become a chef or <laughs> cooking a lot more at home. I have a question. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, I know that there's changes with like the COVID-19 and thank you for talking about the different things you're doing for employees. But I also have a question. Are you seeing is uh, in the terms of the like the business at the corporate level or the business level, are you seeing this more as a time of growth and trying to like do things for products or are you in like a state of endure or does it depend on industry? I think that's a really good question. I certainly think that industry plays into it. Um, but so does culture, right? We talked a lot about culture. What is the mindset of the organization? And I've seen um, both. So I've seen a pretty decent split in that. There are a lot of organizations, even eight months into this right now, who are still trying to figure out what steady state looks like with COVID, um, who don't have um, policies for masking policies for PPE and social, social distancing. So there are still organizations who are still trying to get there. Um, but I've also seen organizations who are in hyper growth mode because they're taking this opportunity to um, develop new products and services. I just talked to um, a startup today who lost a lot of their business. So the revenues are actually down, but instead of doing layoffs or anything like that, they took this time to pay their employees all to do an innovation session. And they have now, they're close to launching a brand new product. Um, so I've seen that and I've seen everything in between. So I do think it's industry specific, um, depends on the leader you have and certainly the culture that exists within the organization. Lotus, I think you made an excellent point at the end also, just it depends on the leader. I think for us, we, I'm in nonprofit and many of our nonprofits are obviously struggling financially. And one of the things that we decided to do was partner with our, partner more with state and local uh, affiliates to not compete against the same work or issues, but to share those so that we can at least have work for everyone. Um, and so you just have to kind of reinvent yourself in this new way and really think about how to serve the greater good and not just think solely about how, uh, uh, how, how to work within your own environment. Great. Thank you for sharing. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Nika, for asking the question. And we have another question to everyone from Jackie. Uh, the news is full of stories that people are dropping out of the workforce to care for children and elders. And because of this, work is no longer fun. Well, panelists, would you like to weigh in on that, your thoughts? I'll start off. Um, I, what's most alarming is women are leaving the workforce. So all this work we've, we've done to try and get you know, onboarding and offboarding for women during you know, times of their life is, is, being, is being challenged right now. Uh, another thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll, and I'll leave it to the rest of the panel, is I think as HR practitioners uh, and leaders in the business, we have to think differently around what kind of benefits we offer that are different than we typically offered. You know, we, you know we've given, we've really worked on giving people extended leaves when they're paternity, maternity, when they're having uh, family events. We need to be thinking about mental health benefits, we need to be thinking about elder care benefits, we need to be thinking about school benefits in terms of children online while the parents work. So I think we have to reimagine not only the way we lead, but also some of the benefits that we have not offered, especially in the US, where I think we're a little stingy compared to other parts of the world in terms of the benefits afforded to their employees. And I think we have to think differently about that. So I don't have the answer, but I am, I'm gonna put out there that I'm concerned about the number of women dropping out and I'm concerned about whether or not we have the right sort of um, safety net in this time of change to help people work through it, both from a mental health perspective as well as a caregiving perspective. I'm passionate about this. <laughs> I, well, I like that, Amy. I think also, I just wanna say something to the word fun. Fun like happiness is a choice. 
And we can either run and hide and be fearful and disappointed by this global pandemic and all of the other things that are happening, or we can choose to fight for our peace and for what we really care about. And so when I hear staff say that life work isn't fun, I say, what are you doing to make that change? Like I put that component of it back on the person because it is an individual choice. I can support you in that, but I cannot create fun or happiness for you. That's Now that's like the deep HR side. Now to the point where we see that, yes, we are going to have to consider uh, people balancing um, children and, and elder care uh, as part of our stories, as you put it, that's very important, like Amy said. And I do think that there needs to be strategy and conversations around those core topics so that there's a true plan and it's not a one size fits all model. Unfortunately, it's not going to be like I could create a strategy for my organization, but it may not work in another environment. So we do have to be flexible and nimble in what we create so that it is specific to the needs of your, your space and not looking at what someone else is doing and saying we should be doing it that way. Yeah, that's a really good point, Dr. Walker, because one of the things that we did is we asked our employees, what's the problem? What are you dealing with? What are the issues you're dealing with that we need to try to figure out how to solve for? And part of that we found actually was fairly easy, right? We, we only have about 20, 25% of our people actually in the office. The rest of us are kind of working from home. So for a big portion of the organization, we became very flexible in this aspect of taking care of kids or elder care. And to Amy's point, a lot of that burden fell on our female employees. And we're, we're in an industry where it's engineering and automotive. So it's, you know, we're already struggling getting the right amount of really talented females in our organization. So losing any is a problem. So it's that ability to listen and be really flexible. And uh, that's, that's what we've done. We already figured out we can work from home a lot better than we thought. So why can't we be flexible, especially with people that are really struggling with the, those kind of issues? That was a great question. Jackie, thank you for asking. Um, are there any, any other questions? We have just a few minutes left. Any other audience questions they'd like to ask of the panel? All right. Well, I want to just wrap up here and thank each and every one of you for your time today, your insights. Clearly, you're incredible leaders. You have so many um, important things to share. I'm looking forward to reviewing this again um, once we are able to share the recording with you. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you for volunteering your valuable time with us. And thank you to the uh, participants, all the audience members that joined, um, whether you ask questions or not. Um, if you have any, feel free to push them out. And a big thanks to um, our host today, the Hana House hosts, Brian and Colin. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, yeah, so we, I just posted the survey link. So if you have time, please fill out that survey link, provide any feedback. Uh, we'll be happy to, you know, promote our future, uh, our future events as well. And again, thank you for the panelists. That was an amazing discussion. And this recording will be uploaded onto our Hannah House YouTube channel and then emailed out to everyone. So yeah, stay tuned for our November Business Bites. It'll be a very, another very exciting time. Very good. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Thanks, Shelly. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Be safe. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.